This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Short History of England by G. K. Chesterton. Chapter 10 The War of the Usurpers. The poet Pope though a friend of the greatest of Tory Democrats, Bolingbroke, necessarily lived in a world in which even Toryism was Whiggish. And the Whig, as a wit, never expressed his political point more clearly than in Pope's line which ran, The right divine of kings to govern wrong. It will be apparent when I deal with that period that I do not palliate the real unreason in divine right, as Filmer and some of the pedantic cavaliers construed it. They professed the impossible ideal of non-resistance to any national and legitimate power, though I cannot see that even that was so servile and superstitious as the more modern ideal of non-resistance, even to a foreign and lawless power. But the seventeenth century was an age of sects, that is, of fads, and the Filmerites made a fad of divine right, its roots were older, equally religious, but much more realistic, and though tangled with many other and even opposite things of the Middle Ages, ramify through all the changes we have now to consider. The connection can hardly be stated better than by taking Pope's easy epigram and pointing out that it is, after all, very weak in philosophy. The right divine of kings to govern wrong considered as a sneer, really evades all that we mean by a right. To have a right to do a thing is not at all the same as to be right in doing it. What Pope says satirically about a divine right is what we all say quite seriously about a human right. If a man has a right to vote, has he not a right to vote wrong? If a man has a right to choose his wife, has he not a right to choose wrong? I have a right to express the opinion which I am now setting down, but I should hesitate to make the controversial claim that this proves the opinion to be right. Now medieval monarchy, though only one aspect of medieval rule, was roughly represented in the idea that the ruler had a right to rule as a voter has a right to vote. He might govern wrong, but unless he governed horribly and extravagantly wrong, he retained his position of right. As a private man retains his right to marriage and locomotion unless he goes horribly and extravagantly off his head. It was not really even so simple as this, for the Middle Ages were not, as it is often the fashion to fancy, under a single and steely discipline. They were very controversial and therefore very complex, and it is easy by isolating items whether about just divinum or primus inter pares, to maintain that the medievals were almost anything. It has been seriously maintained that they were all Germans. But it is true that the influence of the church, though by no means of all the great churchmen, encouraged the sense of a sort of sacrament of government, which was meant to make the monarch terrible, and therefore often made the man tyrannical. The disadvantage of such despotism is obvious enough. The precise nature of its advantage must be better understood than it is, not for its own sake so much as for the story we have now to tell. The advantage of divine right or irremovable legitimacy is this, that there is a limit to the ambitions of the rich. Roy ne puis, the royal power whether it was or was not the power of heaven, was in one respect like the power of heaven. It was not for sale. Constitutional moralists have often implied that a tyrant and a rabble have the same vices. It has perhaps been less noticed that a tyrant and a rabble most emphatically have the same virtues. And one virtue which they very markedly share is that neither tyrants nor rabbles are snobs. They do not care a button what they do to wealthy people. It is true that tyranny was sometimes treated as coming from the heavens, 
almost in the lesser and more literal sense of coming from the sky. A man had no more expected to be the king than to be the west wind or the morning star. But at least no wicked miller can chain the wind to turn only his own mill. No pedantic scholar can trim the morning star to be his own reading lamp. And something very like this is what really happened to England in the later Middle Ages, and the first sign of it, I fancy, was the fall of Richard II. Shakespeare's historical plays are something truer than historical. They are traditional. The living memory of many things lingered, though the memory of others was lost. He is right in making Richard II incarnate the claim to divine right, and Bolingbroke the baronial ambition which ultimately broke up the old medieval order. But divine right had become at once drier and more fantastic by the time of the Tudors. Shakespeare could not recover the fresh and popular part of the thing, for he came at a later stage in a process of stiffening, which is the main thing to be studied in later medievalism. Richard himself was possibly a wayward and exasperating prince. It might well be the weak link that snapped in the strong chain of the Plantagenets. There may have been a real case against the coup d'etat which he effected in 1397, and his kinsman Henry of Bolingbroke may have had strong sections of disappointed opinion on his side when he effected in 1399 the first true usurpation in English history. But if we wish to understand that larger tradition which even Shakespeare had lost, we must glance back at something which befell Richard even in the first years of his reign. It was certainly the greatest event of his reign, and it was possibly the greatest event of all the reigns which are rapidly considered in this book. The real English people, the men who work with their hands, lifted their hands to strike their masters, probably for the first and certainly for the last time in history. Pagan slavery had slowly perished, not so much by decaying as by developing into something better. In one sense it did not die, but rather came to life. The slave owner was like a man who should set up a row of sticks for a fence and then find that they had struck root and were budding into small trees. They would be at once more valuable and less manageable, especially less portable. And such a difference between a stick and a tree was precisely the difference between a slave and a serf, or even the free peasant which the serf seemed rapidly tending to become. It was in the best sense of a battered phrase a social evolution and it had the great evil of one. The evil was that while it was essentially orderly, it was still literally lawless. That is, the emancipation of the commons had already advanced very far, but it had not yet advanced far enough to be embodied in a law. The custom was unwritten, like the British Constitution, and like that evolutionary, not to say evasive entity, could always be overridden by the rich, who now drive their great coaches through acts of parliament. The new peasant was still legally a slave, and was to learn it by one of those turns of fortune which confound a foolish faith in the common sense of unwritten constitutions. The French wars gradually grew to be almost as much of a scourge to England as they were to France. England was despoiled by her own victories. Luxury and poverty increased at the extremes of society, and by a process more proper to an ensuing chapter, the balance of the better medievalism was lost. Finally, a furious plague called the Black Death burst like a blast on the land, thinning the population and throwing the work of the world into ruin. There was a shortage of labor, a difficulty of getting luxuries, and the great lords did what one would expect them to do. They became lawyers and upholders of the letter of the law. They appealed to a rule already nearly obsolete to drive the serf back to the more direct servitude of the Dark Ages. They announced their decision to the people, and the people rose in arms. The two dramatic stories which connect Watt Tyler, doubtfully with the beginning and definitely with the end of the revolt, are far from unimportant. Despite the desire of our present prosaic historians to pretend that all dramatic stories are unimportant. The tale of Tyler's first blow is significant in the sense that it is not only dramatic but domestic. It avenged an insult to the family 
and made the legend of the whole riot, whatever its incidental indecencies, a sort of demonstration on behalf of decency. This is important, for the dignity of the poor is almost unmeaning in modern debates, and an inspector need only bring a printed form and a few long words to do the same thing without having his head broken. The occasion of the protest and the form which the feudal reaction had first taken was a poll tax. But this was but a part of a general process of pressing the population to servile labor, which fully explains the ferocious language held by the government after the rising had failed. The language in which it threatened to make the state of the serf more servile than before. The facts attending the failure in question are less in dispute. The medieval populace showed considerable military energy and cooperation, stormed its way to London, and was met outside the city by a company containing the king and the lord mayor, who were forced to consent to a parley. The treacherous stabbing of Tyler by the mayor gave the signal for battle and massacre on the spot. The peasants closed in roaring, they have killed our leader, when a strange thing happened something which gives us a fleeting and a final glimpse of the crowned sacramental man of the Middle Ages. For one wild moment, divine right was divine. The king was no more than a boy. His very voice must have rung out to that multitude almost like the voice of a child. But the power of his fathers and the great Christendom from which he came fell in some strange fashion upon him. And riding out alone before the people, he cried out, I am your leader and himself promised to grant them all they asked. That promise was afterwards broken, but those who see in the breach of it the mere fickleness of the young, frivolous king are not only shallow, but utterly ignorant interpreters of the whole trend of the time. The point must be seized, if subsequent things are to be seen as they are, is that Parliament certainly encouraged, and Parliament almost certainly obliged the king to repudiate the people. For when, after the rejoicing revolutionists had disarmed and were betrayed, the king urged a humane compromise on the Parliament, and the Parliament furiously refused it. Already, Parliament is not merely a governing body, but a governing class. Parliament was as contemptuous of the peasants in the 14th as of the Chartists in the 19th century. This council, first summoned by the king, like juries, and many other things, to get from plain men rather reluctant evidence about taxation, has already become an object of ambition, and is therefore an aristocracy. There is already war, in this case literally to the knife, between the commons with a large C and the commons with a small one. Talking about the knife, it is notable that the murderer of Tyler was not a mere noble, but an elective magistrate of the mercantile oligarchy of London though there is probably no truth in the tale that his blood-stained dagger figures on the arms of the city of London. The medieval Londoners were quite capable of assassinating a man, but not of sticking so dirty a knife into the neighborhood of the cross of their Redeemer, in the place which is really occupied by the sword of St. Paul. It is remarked above that Parliament was now an aristocracy, being an object of ambition. The truth is perhaps more subtle than this, but if ever men yearn to serve on juries, we may probably guess that juries are no longer popular. Anyhow, this must be kept in mind, as against the opposite idea of the just divinum, or fixed authority, if we would appreciate the fall of Richard. If the thing which dethroned him was a rebellion, it was a rebellion of the Parliament, of the thing that had just proved more pitiless than he, toward a rebellion of the people. But this is not the main point. The point is that, by the removal of Richard, a step above the Parliament became possible for the first time. The transition was tremendous. The crown became an object of ambition. That which one could snatch, another could snatch from him. That which the House of Lancaster held merely by force, the House of York could take from it by force. The spell of an undethronable king, seated out of reach, was broken. And for three unhappy generations, Adventurers strove and stumbled on a stairway slippery with blood, above which was something new in the medieval imagination, an empty throne. It is obvious that the insecurity of the Lancastrian usurper, largely because he was a usurper, is the clue to many things, some of which we should now call good, 
some bad, all of which we should probably call good or bad with the excessive facility with which we dismiss distant things. It led the Lancastrian House to lean on Parliament, which was the mixed matter we have already seen. It may have been in some ways good for the monarchy to be checked and challenged by an institution which at least kept something of the old freshness and freedom of speech. It was almost certainly bad for the Parliament, making it yet more the ally of the mere ambitious noble, of which we shall see much later. It also led the Lancastrian House to lean on patriotism, which was perhaps more popular, to make English the tongue of the court for the first time, and to reopen the French wars with a fine flag-waving of Agincourt. It led again to lean on the church, or rather perhaps on the higher clergy, and that in the least worthy aspect of clericalism. A certain morbidity which more and more darkened the end of medievalism showed itself in new and more careful cruelties against the last crop of heresies. A slight knowledge of the philosophy of these heresies will lend little support to the notion that they were in themselves prophetic of the Reformation. It's hard to see how anybody can call Wycliffe a Protestant, unless he calls Pelagius or Arius a Protestant. And if John Ball was a reformer, Latimer was not a reformer. But though the new heresies did not even hint at the beginning of English Protestantism, they did perhaps hint at the end of English Catholicism. Cobham did not light a candle to be handed on to nonconformist chapels, but Arundel did light a torch and put it into his own church. Such real unpopularity as did the time attached to the old religious system, and which afterwards became a true national tradition against Mary, was doubtless started by the diseased energy of these fifteenth-century bishops. Persecution can be a philosophy, and a defensible philosophy, but with some of these men persecution was rather a perversion. Across the channel one of them was presiding at the trial of Joan of Arc. But this perversion... This diseased energy is the power in all the epoch that follows the fall of Richard II, and especially in those feuds that found so ironic an imagery in English roses and thorns. The foreshortening of such a backward glance as this book can alone claim to be forbids any entrance into the military mazes of the wars of York and Lancaster, or any attempt to follow the thrilling recoveries and revenges which filled the lives of Warwick the Kingmaker, and the warlike widow of Henry V. The rivals were not, indeed, as is sometimes exaggeratively implied, fighting for nothing, or even, like a lion and the unicorn, merely fighting for the crown. The shadow of a moral difference can still be traced even in that stormy twilight of a heroic time. But when we have said that Lancaster stood on the whole for the new notion of a king propped by parliaments and powerful bishops, and York on the whole for the remains of the older idea of a king who permits nothing to come between him and his people, we have said everything of permanent political interest that could be traced by counting all the bows of Barnet or all the lances of Tewkesbury. But this truth, that there was something which can only vaguely be called Tory about the Yorkist, has at least one interest that it lends a justifiable romance to the last and most remarkable figure of the fighting house of York, with whose fall the Wars of the Roses ended. If we desire at all to catch the strange colors of the sunset of the Middle Ages, to see what had changed, yet not wholly killed chivalry, there is no better study than the riddle of Richard the Third. Of course, scarcely a line of him was like the caricature with which his much meaner successor placarded the world when he was dead. He was not even a hunchback. He had one shoulder slightly higher than the other, probably the effect of his furious swordsmanship on a naturally slender and sensitive frame. Yet his soul, if not his body, haunts us somehow, as the crooked shadow of a straight knight of better days. He was not an ogre shedding rivers of blood. Some of the men he executed deserved it as much as any men of that wicked time. And even the tale of his murdered nephews is not certain and is told by those who also tell us he was born with tusks, and was originally covered with hair. Yet a crimson cloud cannot be dispelled from his memory, and so tainted is the very air of that time with carnage, that we cannot say he was incapable even of the things 
of which he may have been innocent. Whether or no he was a good man, he was apparently a good king, and even a popular one. Yet we think of him vaguely, and not, I fancy, untruly, as on sufferance. He anticipated the Renaissance in an abnormal enthusiasm for art and music, and he seems to have held to the old paths of religion and charity. He did not pluck perpetually at his sword and dagger, because his only pleasure was in cutting throats. He probably did it because he was nervous. It was the age of our first portrait painting, and a fine contemporary portrait of him throws a more plausible light on this particular detail, for it shows him touching and probably twisting a ring on his finger, the very act of a high-strung personality who would also fidget with the dagger. And in his face, as there painted, we can study all that has made it worthwhile to pause so long upon his name, an atmosphere very different from everything before and after. The face has a remarkable intellectual beauty, but there is something else on the face that is hardly in itself either good or evil, and that thing is death, the death of an epic, the death of a great civilization, the death of something which once sang to the sun in the canticle of St. Francis and sailed to the ends of the earth in ships of the first crusade, but which in peace wearied and turned its weapons inwards, wounded its own brethren, broke its own loyalties, gambled for the crown, and grew feverish even about the creed, and has this one grace among its dying virtues, that its valor is the last to die. But whatever else may have been bad or good about Richard of Gloucester, there was a touch about him which makes him truly the last of the medieval kings. It is expressed in the one word which he cried aloud as he struck down foe after foe in the last charge at Bosworth. Treason. For him, as for the first Norman kings, treason was the same as treachery, and in this case at least it was the same as treachery. When his nobles deserted him before the battle, he did not regard it as a new political combination, but as the sin of false friends and faithless servants. Using his own voice like the trumpet of a herald, he challenged his rival to a fight as personal as that of two paladins of Charlemagne. His rival did not reply and was not likely to reply. The modern world had begun. The call echoed unanswered down the ages, for since that day no English king has fought after that fashion. Having slain many, he was himself slain, and his diminished force destroyed. So ended the War of the Usurpers, and the last and most doubtful of all the usurpers, a wanderer from the Welsh marches, a knight from nowhere, found the crown of England under a bush of thorn. End of chapter 10This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Short History of England by G. K. Chesterton Chapter 11 The Rebellion of the Rich Sir Thomas More, apart from any arguments about the more mystical meshes in which he was ultimately caught and killed, will be hailed by all as a hero of the new learning, that great dawn of a more rational daylight which for so many made medievalism seem a mere darkness. Whatever we think of his appreciation of the Reformation, there will be no dispute about his appreciation of the Renaissance. He was, above all things, a humanist, and a very human one. He was even in many ways very modern, which some rather erroneously suppose to be the same as being human. He was also humane, in the sense of humanitarian. He sketched an ideal, or rather perhaps a fanciful social system, with something of the ingenuity of Mr. H. G. Wells, but essentially with much more than the flippancy attributed to Mr. Bernard Shaw. It is not fair to charge the utopian notions upon his morality, 
but their subjects and suggestions mark what, for want of a better word, we can only call his modernism. Thus the immortality of animals is the sort of transcendentalism which savors of evolution, and the grosser jest about the preliminaries of marriage might be taken quite seriously by the students of eugenics. He suggested a sort of pacifism, though the utopians had a quaint way of achieving it. In short, while he was, with his friend Erasmus, a satirist of medieval abuses, few would now deny that Protestantism was too narrow rather than too broad for him. If he was obviously not a Protestant, there are few Protestants who would deny him the name of a reformer. But he was an innovator in things more alluring to modern minds than theology. He was partly what we should call a neo-pagan. His friend Collette summed up that escape from medievalism which might be called passage from bad Latin to good Greek. In our loose modern debates they are lumped together, but Greek learning was the growth of this time. There had always been a popular Latin, if a dog Latin. It would be nearer the truth to call the medievals bilingual than to call their Latin a dead language. Greek never, of course, became so general a possession. But for the man who got it, it is not too much to say that he felt as if he were in the open air for the first time. Much of this Greek spirit was reflected in Moore. Its universality, its urbanity, its balance of buoyant reason and cool curiosity. It is even probable that he shared some of the excesses and errors of taste which inevitably infected the splendid intellectualism of the reaction against the Middle Ages. We can imagine him thinking gargoyles gothic, in the sense of barbaric, or even failing to be stirred as Sidney was by the trumpet of Chevy Chase. The wealth of the ancient heathen world in wit, loveliness, and civic heroism had so recently been revealed to that generation in its dazzling profusion and perfection, that it might seem a trifle if they did not here and there an injustice to the relics of the Dark Ages. When therefore we look at the world with the eyes of Moore, we are looking from the widest windows of that time, looking over an English landscape seen for the first time very equally in the level light of the sun at morning. For what he saw was England of the Renaissance, England passing from the medieval to the modern. Thus he looked forth and saw many things, and said many things, and many witty. But he noticed one thing, which is at once a horrible fancy, and a homely and practical fact. He who looked over that landscape said, Sheep are eating men. This singular summary of the great epic of our emancipation and enlightenment is not the fact usually put first in such very curt historical accounts of it. It has nothing to do with the translation of the Bible, or the character of Henry the Eighth, or the characters of Henry the Eighth's wives, or the triangular debates between Henry and Luther and the Pope. It was not Popish sheep who were eating Protestant men, or vice versa. Nor did Henry, at any period of his own brief and rather bewildering papacy, have more martyrs eaten by lambs as the heathen had them eaten by lions. What was meant, of course, by this picturesque expression was that an intensive type of agriculture was giving way to a very extensive type of pasture. Great spaces of England, which had hitherto been cut up into the commonwealth of a number of farmers, were being laid under the sovereignty of a solitary shepherd. The point has been put, by a touch of epigram, rather in the matter of Moore himself, by Mr. J. Stephen, in a striking essay, now I think only to be found in the back files of the new witness. He enunciated the paradox that the very much admired individual who made two blades of grass grow instead of one was a murderer. In the same article, Mr. Stephen traced the true moral origins of this movement, which led to the growing of so much grass, and the murder, or at any rate the destruction, of so much humanity. He traced it, and every true record of that transformation traces it to the growth of a new refinement, in a sense more rational refinement, in the governing class. The medieval lord had been by comparison a coarse fellow. He had merely lived in the largest kind of farmhouse, 
after the fashion of the largest kind of farmer. He drank wine when he could, but he was quite ready to drink ale, and science had not yet smoothed his paths with petrol. At a time later than this, one of the greatest ladies of England writes to her husband that she cannot come to him because her carriage horses are pulling the plough. In the true Middle Ages, the greatest men were even more rudely hampered, but in the time of Henry the Eighth, the transformation was beginning. In the next generation, a phrase was common, which is one of the keys of the time, and is very much the key to these more ambitious territorial schemes. This or that great lord was said to be Italianate. It meant subtler shapes of beauty, delicate and ductile glass, gold and silver, not treated as barbaric stones, but rather as stems and wreaths of molten metal, mirrors, cards, and such trinkets bearing a load of beauty. It meant the perfection of trifles. It was not, as in popular Gothic craftsmanship, the almost unconscious touch of art upon all necessary things. Rather, it was the pouring of the whole soul of passionately conscious art, especially into unnecessary things. Luxury was made alive with a soul. We must remember this real thirst for beauty, for it is an explanation and an excuse. The old barony had indeed been thinned by the civil wars that closed at Bosworth, and curtailed by the economical and crafty policy of that unkingly king, Henry the Seventh, He was himself a new man, but we shall see the barons largely give place to a whole nobility of new men. But even the older families already had their faces set in the newer direction. Some of them, the Howards, for instance, may be said to have figured both as old and new families. In any case, the spirit of the whole upper class can be described as increasingly new. The English aristocracy, which is the chief creation of the Reformation, is undeniably entitled to a certain praise, which is now almost universally regarded as very high praise. It was always progressive. Aristocrats are accused of being proud of their ancestors. It can be truly said that English aristocrats have rather been proud of their descendants. For their descendants, they plant huge foundations and piled mountains of wealth. For their descendants, they fought for a higher and higher place in the government of the state. For their descendants, above all, they nourished every new science or scheme of social philosophy. They seized the vast economic chances of pasturage, but they also drained the fens. They swept away the priests, but they condescended to the philosophers. As the new Tudor house passes through its generations, a new and more rationalist civilization is being made. Scholars are criticizing authentic text. Skeptics are discrediting not only popish saints, but pagan philosophers. Specialists are analyzing and rationalizing traditions, and sheep are eating men. We have seen that in the 14th century in England there was real revolution of the people. It very nearly succeeded, and I need not conceal the conviction that it would have been the best possible thing for all of us if it had entirely succeeded. If Richard II had really sprung into the saddle of Wat Tyler, or rather if his Parliament had not unhorsed him when he had got there, if he had confirmed the fact of the new peasant freedom by some form of royal authority, as it was already common to confirm the fact of the trade unions by the form of royal charter. Our country would probably have had as happy a history as is possible to human nature. The Renaissance, when it came, would have come as a popular education and not the culture of a club of aesthetics. The new learning might have been as democratic as the old learning in the old days of medieval Paris and Oxford. The exquisite artistry of the school of Cellini might have been but the highest grade of the craft of a guild. The Shakespearean drama might have been acted by workmen on wooden stages, set up in the street like Punch and Judy, the finer fulfillment of the miracle play as it was acted by a guild. The players need not have been the king's servants, but their own masters. The great renaissance might have been liberal with its liberal education. If this be a fancy, it is at least one that cannot be disproved 
the medieval revolution was too unsuccessful at the beginning for anyone to show that it needed to have been unsuccessful in the end. The feudal parliament prevailed and pushed back the peasants at least into their dubious and half-developed status. More than this it would be exaggerative to say, and a mere anticipation of the really decisive events afterward. When Henry the Eighth came to the throne, the guilds were perhaps checked, but apparently unchanged, and even the peasants had probably regained ground. Many were still theoretically serfs, but largely under the easy landlordism of the abbots. The medieval system still stood. It might, for all we know, have begun to grow again, but all such speculations are swamped in new and very strange things. The failure of the revolution of the poor was ultimately followed by a counter-revolution, a successful revolution of the rich. The apparent pivot of it was, in certain events, political and even personal. They roughly resolved themselves into two, the marriages of Henry the Eighth and the affair of the monasteries. The marriages of Henry the Eighth have long been a popular and even a stale joke, and there is a truth of tradition in the joke, as there is in almost any joke, if it is sufficiently popular, and indeed if it is sufficiently stale. A jocular thing never lives to be stale, unless it is also serious. Henry was popular in his first days, and even foreign contemporaries give us quite a glorious picture of a young prince of the Renaissance, radiant with all the new accomplishments. In his last days he was something very like a maniac. He no longer inspired love, and even when he inspired fear it was rather the fear of a mad dog than of a watchdog. In this change, doubtless, the inconsistency and even ignominy of his blue-beard weddings played a great part. And it is but just to him to say that perhaps with the exception of the first and the last, he was almost as unlucky in his wives as they were in their husband. But it was undoubtedly the affair of the first divorce that broke the back of his honor, and incidentally broke a very large number of other more valuable and universal things. To feel the meaning of his fury, we must realize that he did not regard himself as the enemy, but rather as the friend of the Pope. There is a shadow of the old story of Becket. He had defended the Pope in diplomacy and the Church in controversy, and when he wearied of his queen and took a passionate fancy to one of her ladies, Anne Boleyn, he vaguely felt that a rather cynical concession, in that age of cynical concessions, might very well be made to him by a friend. But it is part of that high inconsistency, which is the fate of the Christian faith in human hands, that no man knows when the higher side of it will really be uppermost, if only for an instant, and that the worst ages of the church will not do or say something, as if by accident, that is worthy of the best. Anyhow, for whatever reason, Henry sought to lean upon the cushions of Leo and found he had struck his arm upon the rock of Peter. The Pope denied the new marriage, and Henry, in a storm and darkness of anger, dissolved all the old relations with the papacy. It is probable that he did not clearly know how much he was doing then, and it is very tenable that we do not know it now. He certainly did not think he was anti-Catholic, and in one rather ridiculous sense we can hardly say he thought he was anti-papal, since he apparently thought he was Pope. From this day really dates something that played a certain part in history the more modern doctrine of the divine right of kings, widely different from medieval one. It is a matter which further embarrasses the open question about the continuity of Catholic things in Anglicanism, for it was a new note, and yet one struck by the older party. The supremacy of the king over the English national church was not unfortunately merely a fad of the king, but became partly, and for one period, a fad of the church. But apart from all controverted questions, there is at least a human and historic sense in which the continuity of our past is broken perilously at this point. Henry not only cut off England from Europe, but what was even more important, he cuts off England from England. The great divorce brought down Wolseley, the mighty minister who had held the scales between the empire and the French monarchy, and made the modern balance of power in Europe. 
He is often described under the dictum of Ego et Rex Meus. But he marks a stage in the English story rather because he suffered for it than because he said it. Ego et Rex Meus might be the motto of any modern Prime Minister. For we have forgotten the very fact that the word minister merely means servant. Wolseley was the last great servant who could be, and was simply dismissed, the mark of a monarchy still absolute. The English were amazed at it in modern Germany, when Bismarck was turned away like a butler. A more awful act proved the new force was already inhuman. It struck down the noblest of the humanists, Thomas More, who seemed sometimes like an Epicurean under Augustus, died the death of a saint under died Toletian. He died gloriously, jesting, and the death has naturally drawn out for us, rather, the sacred saviors of his soul, his tenderness, his trust in the truth of God. But for humanism, it must have seemed a monstrous sacrifice. It was somehow as if Montaigne were a martyr. And that is indeed the note. Something truly to be called unnatural had already entered the naturalism of the Renaissance, and the soul of the great Christian rose against it. He pointed to the sun, saying, I shall be above that fellow, with Franciscan familiarity, which can love nature because it will not worship her. So he left to his king the sun, which for so many weary days and years was to go down only on his wrath. But the more impersonal process which Moore himself had observed, as noted at the beginning of this chapter, is the more clearly defined and less clouded, with controversies in the second of the two parts of Henry's policy. There is indeed a controversy about the monasteries, but it is one that is clarifying and settling every day. Now it is true that the church, by the Renaissance period, had reached a considerable corruption. But the real proofs of it are utterly different both from the contemporary despotic pretense and from the common Protestant story. It is wildly unfair, for instance, to quote the letters of bishops and such authorities denouncing the sins of monastic life. Violent as they often are, they cannot possibly be more violent than the letters of St. Paul to the purest and most primitive churches. The apostle was there writing to those early Christians whom all churches idealize and he talks to them as to cutthroats and thieves. The explanation for those concerned for such subtleties may possibly be found in the fact that Christianity is not a creed for good men, but for men. Such letters have been written in all centuries, and even in the sixteenth century they do not prove so much that there were bad abbots as that there were good bishops. Moreover, even those who profess that the monks were profligates dare not profess that they were oppressors. There is a truth in Cobbett's point that where monks were landlords, they did not become rack-renting landlords, and could not become absentee landlords. Nevertheless, there was a weakness in the good institutions, as well as a mere strength in the bad ones, and that weakness partakes of the worst element of the time. In the fall of good things there is almost always a touch of betrayal from within, and the abbots were destroyed more easily because they did not stand together. They did not stand together because the spirit of the age, which is very often the worst enemy of the age, was the increasing division between rich and poor, and it had partly divided even the rich and poor clergy, and the betrayal came, as it nearly always comes, from that servant of Christ who holds the bag. To take a modern attack on liberty on a much lower plane, we are familiar with the picture of a politician going to the great brewers or even the great hotel proprietors and pointing out the uselessness of a litter of little public houses. That is what the Tudor politicians did first with the monasteries. They went to the heads of the great houses and proposed the extinction of the small ones. The great monastic lords did not resist, or at any rate did not resist enough, and the sack of the religious houses began. But if the Lord Abbots acted for a moment as lords, they could not excuse them in the eyes of much greater lords, for having frequently acted as abbots. A momentary rally to the cause of the rich did not wipe out the disgrace of a thousand petty interferences, which had told only to the advantage of the poor. 
and they were soon to learn that it was no epic for their easy rule and their careless hospitality. The great houses, now isolated, were themselves brought down one by one, and the beggar, whom the monastery had served as a sort of sacred tavern, came to it at evening and found it a ruin. For a new and wide philosophy was in the world, which still rules our society. By this creed, most of the mystical virtues of the old monks have simply been turned into great sins, and the greatest of these is charity. But the populace, which had risen under Richard II, was not yet disarmed. It was trained in the rude discipline of bow and bill, and organized into local groups of town and guild and manor. Over half the counties of England the people rose and fought one final battle for the vision of the Middle Ages. The chief tool of the new tyranny, a dirty fellow named Thomas Cromwell, was especially singled out as the tyrant, and he was indeed rapidly turning all government into a nightmare. The popular movement was put down partly by force, and there is the new note of modern militarism in the fact that it was put down by cynical professional troops actually brought in from foreign countries who destroyed English religion for hire. But like the old popular rising, it was even more put down by fraud. Like the old rising, it was sufficiently triumphant to force the government to a parley, and the government had to resort to the simple expedient of calming the people with promises, and then proceeding to break first the promises and then the people, after the fashion made familiar to us by the modern politicians in their attitudes toward the great strikes. The revolt bore the name of Pilgrimage of Grace, and its program was practically the restoration of the old religion. In connection with the fancy about the fate of England, if Tyler had triumphed, it proves, I think, one thing, that his triumph, while it might or might not have led to something that could be called a reform, would have rendered quite impossible everything that we now know as the Reformation. The reign of terror established by Thomas Cromwell became an inquisition of the blackest and most unbearable sort. Historians who have no shadow of sympathy with the old religion are agreed that it was uprooted by means more horrible than have ever perhaps been employed in England before or since. It was a government by torturers rendered ubiquitous by spies. The spoliation of the monasteries especially was carried out not only with a violence which recalled barbarism, but with a minuteness for which there is no other word but meanness. It was as if the Dane had returned in the character of a detective. The inconsistency of the king's personal attitude to Catholicism did indeed complicate the conspiracy with new brutalities toward Protestants, but such reaction as there was in this was wholly theological. Cromwell lost that fitful favor and was executed, but the terrorism went on, the more terribly for being simplified to the single vision of the wrath of the king. It culminated in a strange act which rounds off symbolically the story told on an earlier page, for the despot revenged himself on a rebel whose defiance seemed to him to ring down three centuries. He laid waste to the most popular shrine of the English, the shrine to which Chaucer had once ridden singing, because it was also the shrine where King Henry had knelt to repent. For three centuries the church and the people had called Becket a saint. When Henry Tudor arose and called him a traitor, this might well be thought the topmost point of autocracy, and yet it was not really so. For then rose to its supreme height of self-revelation that still stranger something of which we have perhaps fancifully found hints before in this history. The strong king was weak. He was immeasurably weaker than the strong kings of the Middle Ages, and whether or no his failure had been foreshadowed, he failed. The breach he had made in the dyke of the ancient doctrines let in a flood that may almost be said to have washed him away. In a sense he disappeared before he died, for the drama that filled his last days is no longer the drama of his own character. We may put the matter most practically by saying that it is unpractical to discuss whether Froude finds any justification for Henry's crimes in the desire to create a strong national monarchy, for whether or no it was desired, it was not created. 
Least of all our princes did the Tudors leave behind them a secure central government, and the time when monarchy was at its worst comes only one or two generations before the time when it was weakest. But a few years afterwards, as history goes, the relations of the crown and the new servants were to be reversed on a high stage so as to horrify the world, and the acts which had been sanctified with the blood of Moore and soiled with the blood of Cromwell was at the signal of one of that slave's own descendants to fall and kill an English king. The tide which thus burst through the breach and overwhelmed the king as well as the church was the revolt of the rich, and especially of the new rich. They used the king's name and could not have prevailed without his power, but the ultimate effect was rather as if they had plundered the king after he had plundered the monasteries. Amazing little of the wealth, considering the name and theory of the thing, actually remained in royal hands. The chaos was increased, no doubt, by the fact that Edward the Sixth succeeded to the throne as a mere boy. But the deeper truth can be seen in the difficulty of drawing any real line between the two reigns. By marrying into the Seymour family, and thus providing himself with a son, Henry had also provided the country with a very type of powerful family, which was to rule merely by pillage. An enormous and unnatural tragedy, the execution of one of the Seymours by his own brother, was enacted during the impotence of the childish king, and the successful Seymour figured as Lord Protector, even though he would have found it hard to say what he was protecting, since it was not even his own family. Anyhow, it is hardly too much to say that every human thing was left unprotected from the greed of such cannibal protectors. We talk of the dissolution of the monasteries, but what occurred was the dissolution of the whole of the old civilization. Lawyers and lackeys and money lenders, the meanest of lucky men, looted the art and economics of the Middle Ages like thieves robbing a church. Their names, when they did not change them, became the names of the great dukes and marquises of our own day. But if we look back and forth in our history, perhaps the most fundamental act of destruction occurred when the armed men of the Seymours and their sort passed from the sacking of the monasteries to the sacking of the guilds. The medieval trade unions were struck down, their buildings were broken into by the soldiery, and their funds seized by the new nobility. And this simple incident takes all its common meaning out of the assertion, in itself plausible enough, that the guilds, like everything else at the time, were probably not at their best. Proportion is the only practical thing, and it may be true that Caesar was not feeling well on the morning of the Ides of March. But simply to say that the guilds declined is about as true as saying that Caesar quietly decayed from purely natural causes, at the foot of the statue of Pompeii. The End of Chapter 11。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Short History of England by G. K. Chesterton Chapter 12 Spain and the Schism of Nations The revolution that arose out of what is called the Renaissance, and ended up in some countries in what is called the Reformation, did in the internal politics of England one drastic and definite thing. That thing was destroying the institutions of the poor was not the only thing it did, but it was much the most practical. It was the basis of all the problems now connected with capital and labor. How much the theological theories of the time had to do with it is a perfectly fair matter for difference of opinion. But neither party, if educated about the facts, will deny that the same time and temper which produced the religious schism also produced this new lawlessness in the rich. The most extreme Protestant will probably be content to say that Protestantism was not the motive, but the mask. The most extreme Catholic will probably be content to admit that Protestantism was not the sin, but rather the punishment. 
The most sweeping and shameless part of the process was not complete, indeed, until the end of the 18th century, when Protestantism was already passing into skepticism. Indeed, a very decent case could be made out for the paradox that Puritanism was first and last a veneer on paganism, that the thing began in the inordinate thirst for new things in the noblesse of the Renaissance, and ended in the Hellfire Club. Anyhow, what was first founded at the Reformation was a new and abnormally powerful aristocracy, and what was destroyed in an ever-increasing degree was everything that could be held directly or indirectly by the people in spite of such an aristocracy. This fact has filled all the subsequent history of our country. But the next particular point in that history concerns the position of the crown. The king, in reality, had already been elbowed aside by the courtiers, who had crowded behind him just before the bursting of the door. The king is left behind in the rush for wealth, and already can do nothing alone. And of this fact the next reign, after the chaos of Edward the Sixth, affords a very arresting proof. Mary Tudor, daughter of the divorced Queen Catherine, has a bad name, even in popular history, and popular prejudice is generally more worthy of study than scholarly sophistry. Her enemies were indeed largely wrong about her character, but they were not wrong about her effect. She was, in the limited sense, a good woman, convinced, conscientious, rather morbid. But it is true that she was a bad queen, bad for many things, but especially bad for her own most beloved cause. It is true, when all is said, that she set herself to burn out no popery, and managed to burn it in. The concentration of her fanaticism into cruelty, especially its concentration in particular places, and in a short time, did remain like something red-hot in the public memory. It was the first of the series of great historical accidents that separated a real, if not universal, public opinion from the old regime. It has been summarized in the death by fire of the three famous martyrs at Oxford. For one of them, at least, Latimer, was a reformer of the more robust and human type, though another of them, Cranmer, had been so smooth a snob and coward in the council of Henry the Eighth as to make Thomas Cromwell seem by comparison a man. But of what may be called the Latimer tradition, the saner and more genuine Protestantism, I shall speak later. At the time, even the Oxford martyrs probably produced less pity and revulsion than the massacre in the flames of many more obscure enthusiasts, whose very ignorance and poverty made their cause seem more popular than it really was. But this last ugly feature was brought into sharper relief, and produced more conscious or unconscious bitterness because of the other great fact of which I spoke above, which is the determining test of this time of transition. What made all the difference was this, that even in this Catholic reign the property of the Catholic Church could not be restored. The very fact that Mary was a fanatic, and yet this act of justice was beyond the wildest dreams of fanaticism, that is the point. The very fact that she was angry enough to commit wrongs for the church, and yet not bold enough to ask for the rights of the church, that is the test of the time. She was allowed to deprive small men of their lives. She was not allowed to deprive great men of their property, or rather of other people's property. She could punish heresy, she could not punish sacrilege. She was forced into the false position of killing men who had not gone to church, and sparing men who had gone there to steal the church ornaments. What forced her into it? Not certainly her own religious attitude, which was almost maniacally sincere. Not public opinion, which had naturally much more sympathy for the religious humanities, which she did not restore, than for the religious inhumanities, which she did. The force came, of course, from the new nobility and the new wealth they refused to surrender, and the success of this earthly pressure proves that the nobility was already stronger than the crown. The scepter had only been used as a crowbar to break open the door of a treasure-house, 
and it was itself broken or at least bent with the blow there is a truth also in the popular insistence on the story of mary having calais written on her heart when the last relic of the medieval conquest reverted to france mary had the solitary and heroic half virtue of the tudors she was a patriot but patriots are often pathetically behind the times for the very fact that they dwell on old enemies often blinds them to new ones in a later generation cromwell exhibited the same error reversed and continued to keep a hostile eye on spain when he should have kept it on france in our own time the jingoes of fashoda kept it on france when they ought already to have had it on germany with no particular anti-national intention mary nevertheless got herself into an anti-national position toward the most tremendous international problem of her people it is the second of the coincidences that confirmed the sixteenth century change and the name of it was spain the daughter of a spanish queen she married a spanish prince and probably saw no more in such an alliance than her father had done but by the time she was succeeded by her sister elizabeth who was more cut off from the old religion though very tenuously attached to the new one and by the time the project of a similar spanish marriage for elizabeth herself had fallen through something had matured which was wider and mightier than the plots of princes the englishman standing on his little island as on a lonely boat had already felt falling across him the shadow of a tall ship wooden clichés about the birth of the british empire and the spacious days of queen elizabeth have not merely obscured but contradicted the crucial truth from such phrases one would fancy that england in some imperial fashion now first realized that she was great it would be far truer to say that she now first realized that she was small the great poet of the spacious days does not praise her as spacious but only as small like a jewel the vision of universal expansion was wholly veiled until the eighteenth century and even when it came was far less vivid and vital than what came in the sixteenth what came then was not imperialism it was anti-imperialism england achieved at the beginning of her modern history that one thing human imagination will always find heroic the story of a small nationality the business of the armada was to her what bannockburn was to the scots or majuba to the boers a victory that astonished even the victors what was opposed to them was imperialism in its complete and colossal sense a thing unthinkable since rome it was in no overstrained sense civilization itself it was the greatness of spain that was the glory of england it is only when we realize that the english were by comparison as dingy as undeveloped as petty and provincial as boors that we can appreciate the height of their defiance or the splendor of their escape we can only grasp it by grasping that for a great part of europe the cause of the armada had almost the cosmopolitan common sense of a crusade the pope had declared elizabeth illegitimate logically it is hard to see what else he could say having declared her mother's marriage invalid but the fact was another and perhaps a final stroke sundering england from the elder world meanwhile those picturesque english privateers who had plagued the spanish empire of the new world were spoken of in the south simply as pirates and technically the description was true only technical assaults by the weaker party are in retrospect rightly judged with some generous weakness then as if to stamp the contrast in an imperishable image spain or rather the empire with spain for its centre put forth all its strength and seemed to cover the sea with a navy like the legendary navy of xerxes it bore down on the doomed island with the weight and solemnity of a day of judgment sailors or pirates struck at it with small ships staggering under large cannon fought it with mere masses of flaming rubbish and in that last hour of grapple a great storm arose out of the sea and swept round the island and the gigantic fleet was seen no more the uncanny completeness and abrupt silence that swallowed this prodigy touched the nerve that has never ceased to vibrate 
the hope of england dates from that hopeless hour for there is no real hope that has not once been a forlorn hope the breaking of that vast naval net remained like a sign that the small thing which escaped would survive the greatness and yet there is truly a sense in which we may never be so small or so great again for the splendor of the elizabethan age which is always spoken of as a sunrise was in many ways a sunset whether we regard it as the end of the renaissance or the end of the old medieval civilization no candid critic can deny that its chief glories ended with it let the reader ask himself what strikes him specially in elizabethan magnificence and he will generally find it in something of which there were at least traces in medieval times and far fewer traces in modern times the elizabethan drama is like one of its own tragedies its tempestuous torch was soon to be trodden out by the puritans it is needless to say that the chief tragedy was the cutting short of the comedy for the comedy that came to england after the restoration was by comparison both foreign and frigid at the best it is comedy in the sense of being humorous but not in the sense of being happy it may be noted that the givers of good news and good luck in the shakespearean love stories nearly all belong to a world which was passing whether they are friars or fairies it is the same with the chief elizabethan ideals often embodied in the elizabethan drama the national devotion to the virgin queen must not be wholly discredited by its incongruities with the coarse and crafty character of the historical elizabeth her critics might indeed reasonably say that in replacing the virgin mary by the virgin queen the english reformers merely exchanged a true virgin for a false one. but this truth does not dispose of a true though limited contemporary cult whatever we think of that particular virgin queen the tragic heroines of the time offer us a whole procession of virgin queens and it is certain that the medievals would have understood much better than the moderns the martyrdom of measure for measure and as with the title of virgin so with the title of queen the mystical monarchy glorified in richard the second was soon to be dethroned much more ruinously than in richard the second the same puritans who tore off the pasteboard crowns of the stage players were also to tear off the real crowns of the kings whose parts they played all mummery was to be forbidden and all monarchy to be called mummery shakespeare died upon st george day and much of what st george had meant died with him i do not mean that the patriotism of shakespeare or of england died that remained and even rose steadily to be the noblest pride of the coming times but much more than patriotism had been involved in that image of st george to whom the lion heart had dedicated england long ago in the deserts of palestine the conception of patron saint had carried from the middle ages in one very unique and as yet unreplaced idea it was the idea of variation without antagonism the seven champions of christendom were multiplied by seventy times seven in the patrons of towns trades and social types but the very idea that they were all saints excluded the possibility of ultimate rivalry in the fact that they were all patrons the guild of the shoemakers and the guild of the skinners carrying the badges of st crispin and st bartholomew might fight each other in the streets but they did not believe that st crispin and st bartholomew were fighting each other in the skies similarly the english would cry in battle on st george and the french on st denis but they did not seriously believe that st george hated st denis or even those who cried upon st denis joan of arc who was on the point of patriotism what many modern people would call very fanatical was yet upon this point what most modern people would call very enlightened now with the religious schism it cannot be denied a deeper and more inhuman division appeared it was no longer a scrap between the followers of saints who were themselves at peace but a war between the followers of gods who were themselves at war that the great spanish ships were named after st francis or st philip was already beginning to mean little to the new england soon it was to mean something almost cosmically conflicting as if they were named after baal or thor these are indeed mere symbols but the process of which they are symbols was very practical and must be seriously followed 
there entered with the religious wars the idea which modern science applies to racial wars the idea of natural wars not arising from a special quarrel but from the nature of the people quarreling the shadow of racial fatalism first fell across our path and far away in distance and darkness something moved that men had almost forgotten beyond the frontiers of the fading empire lay that outer land as loose and drifting as a sea which had boiled over in the barbarian wars most of it was now formally christian but barely civilized a faint awe of the culture of the south and the west lay on its wild forces like a light frost this semi-civilized world had long been asleep but it had begun to dream in the generation before elizabeth the great man who with all his violence was vitally a dreamer martin luther had cried out in his sleep in a voice like thunder partly against the place of bad customs but largely also against the place of good works in the christian scheme in the generation after elizabeth the spread of the new wild doctrines in the old wild lands had sucked central europe into a cyclic war of creeds in this the house which stood for the legend of the holy roman empire austria the germanic partner of spain fought for the old religion against a league of other germans fighting for the new the continental conditions were indeed complicated and grew more and more complicated as the dream of restoring religious unity receded they were complicated by the firm determination of france to be a nation in the full modern sense to stand free and foursquare from all combinations a purpose which led her while hating her own protestants at home to give diplomatic support to many protestants abroad simply because it preserved the balance of power against the gigantic confederation of spaniards and austrians it is complicated by the rise of calvinistic and commercial power in the netherlands logical defiant defending its own independence valiantly against spain but on the whole we shall be right if we see the first throes of the modern international problems in what is called the thirty years war whether we call it the revolt of the half heathens against the holy roman empire or whether we call it the coming of new sciences new philosophies and new ethics from the north sweden took a hand in the struggle and sent a military hero to the help of the newer germany but the sort of military heroism everywhere exhibited offered a strange combination of more and more complex strategic science with the most naked and cannibal cruelty other forces besides sweden found a career in the carnage far away to the northeast in a sterile land of fens a small ambitious family of moneylenders who had become squires vigilant thrifty thoroughly selfish rather thinly adopted the theories of luther and began to lend their almost savage hinds as soldiers on the protestant side they were well paid for it by step after step of promotion but at this time their principality was only the old mark of brandenburg their name was hohenzollern end of chapter twelve this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Short History of England by G. K. Chesterton Chapter 13 The Age of the Puritans We should be very much bored if we had to read an account of the most exciting argument or string of adventures in which unmeaning words such as snark or boojum were systematically substituted for the names of the chief characters or objects in dispute if we were told that a king was given the alternative of becoming a snark or finally surrendering the boojum or that a mob was roused to fury by the public exhibition of a boojum which was inevitably regarded as a gross reflection on the snark Yet something very like this situation is created by most modern attempts to tell the tale of the theological troubles of the 16th and 17th centuries, while deferring to the fashionable distaste for theology in this generation. 
or rather in the last generation. Thus the Puritans, as their name implies, were primarily enthusiastic for what they thought was pure religion. Frequently they wanted to impose it on others. Sometimes they only wanted to be free to practice it themselves. But in no case can justice be done to what was finest in their characters, as well as first in their thoughts, if we never by any chance ask what it was they wanted to impose or practice. Now there was a great deal that was very fine about many of the Puritans, which is almost entirely missed by the modern admirers of the Puritans. They are praised for things which they either regarded with indifference or more often detested with frenzy, such as religious liberty. And yet they are quite insufficiently understood, and are even undervalued, in their logical case, for the things they really did care about, such as Calvinism. We make the Puritans picturesque in a way they would violently repudiate. In novels and plays they would have publicly burnt. We are interested in everything about them, except the only thing in which they were interested at all. We have seen that in the first instance the new doctrines in England were simply an excuse for plutocratic pillage, and that is the only truth to be told about the matter. But it was far otherwise with the individuals a generation or two after, to whom the wreck of the Armada was already a legend of national deliverance from popery, as miraculous and almost as remote as the deliverance of which they read so realistically in the Hebrew books now lay open to them. The august accident of that Spanish defeat may perhaps have coincided only too well with their concentration on the non-Christian parts of Scripture. It may have satisfied a certain Old Testament sentiment of the election of the English being announced in the stormy oracles of air and sea, which was easily turned into that heresy of a tribal pride that took even heavier hold upon the Germans. It is by such things that civilized state may fall from being a Christian nation to being a chosen people. But even if their nationalism was of a kind that has ultimately proved perilous to the comity of nations, it still was nationalism. From first to last, the Puritans were patriots, a point in which they had market superiority over the French Huguenots. Politically, they were indeed at first but one wing of the new wealthy class which had despoiled the church and were proceeding to despoil the crown. But while they were all merely the creatures of the great spoilation, many of them were the unconscious creatures of it. They were strongly represented in the aristocracy, but a great number were the middle classes, though almost wholly the middle classes of the towns. By the poor agricultural population, which was still by far the largest part of the population, they were simply derided and detested. It may be noted, for instance, that while they led the nation in many of its higher departments, they could produce nothing having the atmosphere of what is rather priggishly called folklore. All the popular tradition there is, as in songs, toasts, rhymes, or proverbs, is all royalist. About the Puritans we can find no great legend. We must put up as best we can with great literature. All these things, however, are simply things that other people might have noticed about them. They are not the most important things, and certainly not the things they thought about themselves. The soul of the movement was in two conceptions, or rather in two steps, the first being the moral process by which they arrived at their chief conclusion and the second, the chief conclusion they arrived at. We will begin with the first, especially as it was this which determined all the external social attitude which struck the eye of contemporaries. The honest Puritans, growing up in youth, in a world swept bare by the great pillage, possessed himself of a first principle, which is one of the three or four alternative first principles which are possible to the mind of man. It was the principle that the mind of man can alone directly deal with the mind of God. It may shortly be called the anti-sacramental principle, but it really applies, and he really applied it, to many things beside the sacraments of the church. It equally applies, and he equally applied it, to art, to letters, to the love of locality, to music, and even to good manners. 
The phrase about no priest coming between a man and his creator is but an impoverished fragment of the full philosophical doctrine. The true Puritan was equally clear that no singer or storyteller or fiddler must translate the voice of God to him into the tongues of terrestrial beauty. It is notable that the one Puritan man of genius in modern times, Tolstoy, did accept this full conclusion, denounced all music as mere drug, and forbade his own admirers to read his own admirable novels. Now the English Puritans were not only Puritans, but Englishmen, and therefore did not always shine in clearness of head. As we shall see, true Puritanism was rather a Scotch than an English thing. But this was the driving power and the direction, and the doctrine is quite tenable, if a trifle insane. Intellectual truth was the only tribute fit for the highest truth of the universe, and the next step in such a study is to observe what the Puritan thought was the truth about that truth, his individual reason cut loose from instinct as well as tradition, taught him a concept of the omnipotence of God, which meant simply the impotence of man. In Luther, the earlier and milder form of the Protestant process, only went so far as to say that nothing a man did could help him except his confession of Christ. With Calvin, it took the last logical step and said that even this could not help him, since omnipotence must have disposed of all his destiny beforehand, that men must be created to be lost and saved. In the pure types of whom I speak, this logic was white-hot, and we must read the formula into all their parliamentary and legal formula. When we read, the Puritan party demanded reforms in the church, we must understand, the Puritan party demanded fuller and clearer affirmation that men are created to be lost and saved. When we read, the army selected persons for their godliness, we must understand, the army selected those persons who seem most convinced that men are created to be lost and saved. It should be added that this terrible trend was not confined even to Protestant countries. Some great Romanists doubtfully followed it until stopped by Rome. It was the spirit of the age, and should be a permanent warning against mistaking the spirit of the age for the immortal spirit of man. For there are now few Christians or non-Christians who can look back at the Calvinism which nearly captured Canterbury, and even Rome, by the genius and heroism of Pascal or Milton, without crying out, like the lady in Mr. Bernard Shaw's play, how splendid, how glorious, and oh, what an escape! The next thing to note is that their conception of church government was in a true sense self-government, and yet, for a particular reason, turned out to be rather selfish government. It was equal, and yet it was exclusive. Internally, the synod or conventicle tended to be a small republic, but fortunately to be a very small republic. In relation to the street outside, the conventicle was not a republic, but an aristocracy. It was the most awful of all aristocracies, that of the elect, for it was not a right of birth, but a right before birth, and alone of all nobilities it was not laid level in the dust. Hence we have, on the one hand, in the simpler Puritans, a ring of real republican virtue, a defiance of tyrants, an assertion of human dignity, but above all an appeal to that first of all republican virtues, publicity. One of the regicides, on trial for his life, struck the note which all the unnaturalness of his school cannot deprive of nobility. This thing was not done in a corner. But their most drastic idealism did nothing to recover a ray of the light that at once lightened every man that came into the world. The assumption of a brotherhood in all baptized people. They were indeed very like that dreadful scaffold at which the regicide was not afraid to point. They were certainly public. They may have been public-spirited. They were never popular. And it seems never to have crossed their minds that there was any need to be popular. England was never so little of democracy as during the short time when she was a republic. 
The struggle with the Stuarts, which is the next passage in our history, arose from an alliance, which some may think an accidental alliance, between two things. The first was this intellectual fashion of Calvinism, which affected the cultural world, as did our recent intellectual fashion of collectivism. The second was the older thing, which had made that creed, and perhaps that cultured world, possible, the aristocratic revolt under the last Tudors. It was, we might say, the story of a father and a son, dragging down the same golden image, but the younger really from hatred of idolatry, and the older solely from love of gold. It is at once the tragedy and the paradox of England that it was the eternal passion that passed and the transient or terrestrial passion that remained. This was true of England, it was far less true of Scotland, and that is the meaning of the Scotch and English war that ended at Worcester. The first change had indeed been much the same materialist manner in both countries, a mere brigandage of barons, and even John Knox, though he has become a national hero, was an extremely anti-national politician. The Patriot Party in Scotland was that of Cardinal Beaton and Mary Stuart. Nevertheless, the new creed did become popular in the lowlands in a positive sense, not even yet known in our own land. Hence, in Scotland, Puritanism was the main thing, and was mixed with parliamentary and other oligarchies. In England, parliamentary oligarchy was the main thing, and was mixed with Puritanism. When the storm began to rise against Charles I, after the more or less transitional time of his father, the Scotch successor of Elizabeth, the instances commonly cited mark all the difference between democratic religion and aristocratic politics. The Scotch legend is that of Jenny Geddes, the poor woman who threw a stool at the priest. The English legend is that of John Hampden, the great squire who raised the country against the king. The parliamentary movement in England was indeed almost wholly a thing of squires, with their new allies, the merchants. They were squires who may well have regarded themselves as the real and natural leaders of the English, but they were leaders who allowed no mutiny among their followers. There was certainly no village Hamden in Hamden village. The Stuarts, it may be suspected, brought from Scotland a more medieval and therefore more logical view of their own function, for the note of their nation was logic. It is a proverb that James I was a Scot and pedant. It is hardly sufficiently noted that Charles I also was not a little of a pedant, being very much of a Scot. He had also the virtues of a Scot, courage and quiet natural dignity and an appetite for the things of the mind. Being somewhat Scottish, he was very un-English and could not manage a compromise. He tried instead to split hairs and seemed merely to break promises. Yet he might safely have been far more inconsistent if he had been a little hardy and hazy. But he was of the sort that sees everything in black and white, and it is therefore remembered, especially the black. From the first he fenced with his parliament as with a mere foe. Perhaps he almost felt it as a foreigner. The issue is familiar, and we need not be so careful as the gentleman who wished to finish the chapter in order to find out what happened to Charles I. His minister, the great Strafford, was foiled in an attempt to make him strong in the fashion of a French king, and perished on the scaffold of frustrated rich loot. The Parliament claiming the power of the purse, Charles appealed to the power of the sword, and at first carried all before him. But success passed to the wealth of the parliamentary class, the discipline of the new army, and the patience and genius of Cromwell, and Charles died the same death as his great servant. Historically, the quarrel resolved itself, through ramifications generally followed, perhaps in more detail than they deserve, into the great modern query of whether a king can raise taxes without the consent of his parliament. The test case was that of Hamden the great Buckinghamshire magnate, who challenged the legality of a tax which Charles imposed professedly for a national navy. As even innovators always of necessity seek for sanctity in the past, the Puritan squires made a legend of the medieval Magna Carta, and they were so far in a true tradition 
that the concession of John had really been, as we have already noted, anti-despotic without being democratic. These two truths cover two parts of the problem of the Stuart Fall, which are very different certainly and should be considered separately. For the first point about democracy, no candid person in the face of the facts can really consider it at all. It is quite possible to hold that the 17th century Parliament was fighting for the truth. It is not possible to hold that it was fighting for the populace. After the autumn of the Middle Ages, Parliament was always actively aristocratic and actively anti-popular. The institution which forbade Charles I to raise ship money was the same institution which previously forbade Richard II to free the serfs. The group which claimed coal and minerals from Charles I was the same which afterward claimed the common lands from the village community. It was the same institution which only two generations before had eagerly helped to destroy not merely things of popular sentiment like the monasteries, but all the things of popular utility like the guilds and parishes, the local government of towns and trades. The work of the great lords may have had, indeed it certainly had, another more patriotic and creative side, but it was exclusively the work of the great lords that was done by Parliament. The House of Commons has itself been a House of Lords. But when we turn to the other or anti-despotic aspect of the campaign against the Stuarts, we come to something much more difficult to dismiss and much more easy to justify. While the stupidest things are said against the Stuarts, the real contemporary case for their enemies is little realized, for it is connected with what our insular history most neglects, the condition of the continent. It should be remembered that though the Stuarts failed in England, they fought for things that succeeded in Europe. These were roughly, first, the effects of the Counter-Reformation, which made the sincere Protestant see Stuart Catholicism not at all as the last flicker of an old flame, but as the spread of a conflagration. Charles II, for instance, was a man of strong, skeptical, and almost irritably humorous intellect, and he was quite certainly and even reluctantly convinced of Catholicism as a philosophy. The other and more important matter here was the almost awful autocracy that was being built up in France like a Bastille. It was more logical, and in many ways more equal and even equitable than the English oligarchy, but it really became a tyranny in case of rebellion or even resistance. There were none of the rough English safeguards of juries and good customs of the old common law. There was letter de cachet, as unanswerable as magic. The English who defied the law were better off than the French. A French satirist would probably have retorted that it was the English who obeyed the law who were worse off than the French. The ordering of men's normal lives was with the squire, but he was, if anything, more limited when he was a magistrate. He was stronger as master of the village, but actually weaker as agent of the king. In defending this state of things, in short, the Whigs were certainly not defending democracy, but they were, in a real sense, defending liberty. They were even defending some remains of medieval liberty, though not the best. The jury, not the guild, even feudalism, had involved a localism not without liberal elements which lingered in the aristocratic system. Those who loved such things might well be alarmed at the leviathan of the state, which for Hobbes was a single monster, and for France a single man. As to the mere facts, it must be said, again, that in so far as Puritanism was pure, it was unfortunately passing, and the very type of the transition by which it passed can be found in that extraordinary man who is popularly credited with making it predominant. Oliver Cromwell is, in history, much less the leader of Puritanism than the tamer of Puritanism. He was undoubtedly possessed, certainly in his youth, possibly all his life, by the rather sombre religious passions of his period. But as he emerges into importance, he stands more and more for the positivism of the English as compared with the Puritanism of the Scotch. He is one of the Puritan squires, but he is steadily more of the squire and less of the Puritan. 
and he points to the process by which the squirearchy became at last merely pagan. This is the key to most of what is praised and most of what is blamed in him, the key to the comparative sanity, toleration, and modern efficiency of many of his departures, the key to the comparative coarseness, earthiness, cynicism, and lack of sympathy in many others. He was the reverse of an idealist, and he cannot be without absurdity be held up as an ideal. But he was, like most of the squires, a type genuinely English, not without public spirit, certainly not without patriotism. His seizure of personal power, which destroyed an impersonal and ideal government, had something English in its very unreason. The act of killing the king, I fancy, was not primarily his, and certainly not characteristically his. It was a concession to the high, inhuman ideals of the tiny group of true Puritans, with whom he had to compromise, but with whom he afterward collided. It was logic rather than cruelty in the act that was not Cromwellian, for he treated with bestial cruelty the native Irish, whom the new spiritual exclusiveness regarded as beasts, or as the modern euphemism would put it, as aborigines. But his practical temper was more akin to such human slaughter on what seemed to him the edges of civilization than to a sort of human sacrifice in the very center and form of it. He is not a representative regicide. In a sense, that piece of headsmanship was rather above his head. The real regicides did it in a sort of trance or vision, and he was not troubled with visions. But the true collision between the religious and rational sides of the seventeenth-century movement came symbolically on that day of driving storm at Dunbar, when the raving Scotch preachers overruled Leslie and forced him down into the valley to be the victim of the Cromwellian common sense. Cromwell said that God had delivered them into his hand, but it was their own God who delivered them, the dark, unnatural God of the Calvinist dreams, as overpowering as a nightmare, and as passing. It was the Whig, rather than the Puritan, that triumphed on that day. It was the Englishman, with his aristocratic compromise, and even what followed Cromwell's death, the Restoration, was an aristocratic compromise, and even a Whig compromise. The mob might cheer as for a medieval king, but the Protectorate and the Restoration were more of a peace than the mob understood. Even in the superficial things, where there seemed to be a rescue, it was ultimately a respite. Thus the Puritan regime had risen chiefly by one thing, unknown to medievalism, militarism. Picked professional troops, harshly drilled but highly paid, were the new and alien instrument by which the Puritans became masters. These were disbanded, and their return resisted by Tories and Whigs. But their return seemed always imminent, because it was in the spirit of the new stern world of the Thirty Years' War. A discovery is an incurable disease, and it had been discovered that a crowd could be turned into an iron centipede, crushing larger and looser crowds. Similarly, the remains of Christmas were rescued from the Puritans, but they had eventually to be rescued again by Dickens from the utilitarians, and may yet have to be rescued by someone from the vegetarians and teetotalers. The strange army passed and vanished, almost like a Moslem invasion, but it had made the difference that armed valor and victory always make, if it was but a negative difference. It was the final break in our history. It was a breaker of many things, and perhaps a popular rebellion in our land. It is something of a verbal symbol that these men founded New England in America, for indeed they tried to found it here. By a paradox, there was something prehistoric in the very nakedness of their novelty. Even the old and savage things they invoked became more savage in becoming more new. In observing what is called their Jewish Sabbath, they would have had to stone the strictest Jew and they, and indeed their age generally, turned witch-hunting from an episode to an epidemic. The destroyers and the things destroyed disappeared together, but they remain as something nobler 
than the nibbling legalism of some of the Whig cynics who continue their work. They were, above all things, anti-historic, like the futurists in Italy, and there was this unconscious greatness about them, that their very sacrilege was public and solemn like a sacrament, and they were ritualists even as iconoclasts. It was, properly considered, but a very secondary example of their strange and violent simplicity that one of them, before a mighty mob at Whitehall, cut off the anointed head of the sacramental man of the Middle Ages. For another, far away in the western shires, cut down the thorn of Glastonbury, from which had grown the whole story of Britain. End of chapter 13